Good morning, everyone. It looks like we're having a number of people joining us on the, on the presentation. I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, today, we have a, a really interesting presentation by Kyle Dool, a Clemson student at Clemson University that's contracted with uh, Tenant at the Top uh, to put together this five-year update of the comprehensive plan analysis for our upstate counties. Um, we'll be going into the presentation in a little bit. Uh, but my name is Phil Lindler, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Upstate Professional Planners Group. Uh, if you don't know about us, we're, we get together about four times a year. Uh, goes, we, we identify some things going on in the upstate, some topics that are timely for all of us that we're all going through with different activities in our communities and um, try to help each other. And uh, today we're going to be identifying some of the things that we all have a part or play a part in, and that's the comprehensive planning process. Um, a number of us are going through that process, have finished that process, or about to begin the process. So, you know, we're all on our di on different time uh, schedules, but this is just kind of a look in on where we are with this process. Before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael Foreman, uh, who is uh, our other co-chair for the Upstate Professional Planners Group, and he'll talk about our sponsors for today. Thank you, Phil. I was going to uh, quickly uh, thank our sponsors that uh, always come up large for us here at the, with 10 at the top and specifically for the upstate professional planners. Uh, those sponsors are Millican and Rewa. And from there, I was going to turn it over to Kyle. However, he is having some technical difficulties at the moment. So what I'm going to do is turn it back over to Phil to kind of give us a quick um, just rundown of what the project uh, entails where we are to this point, and then hopefully Kyle will be able to join us here within the next couple minutes and, and get us going. Sure. Um, the around five or six years ago, uh, Clemson University's planning program, their students uh, took um, all of the upstate counties and looked at their comprehensive plans and did a study on what was similar about them, what was unique about each of those uh, individual plans, and what were the commonalities between those. Um, because obviously, as you can imagine, uh, things have changed over the last five years. A number of those uh, plans have been up updated, modified. Um, uh, obviously, uh, some of them haven't been changed. Some are still static. Um, maybe in the next 10 years or, or next five years, they'll be updated a little bit further. Uh, but as we were going through this, with as many changes as the upstate has seen uh, just in the last five years, we thought it was important to take another uh, deep dive into what's going on with these um, local counties. Uh, we, in uh, five years ago, we looked at the individual um, uh, counties, uh, the 10 county region. We also this year added uh, the city of Greenville and the city of Spartanburg uh, because those are important aspects to the upstate and wanted to include those uh, as our two largest cities. And I believe we have Kyle on the line now. Yes, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, How are you I'm, doing, Kyle? I'm all right now that I have internet and electricity. Terrific, yeah. excellent. <laughs> so I apologize for the wait. Thank you, we were just going through and introducing just the topic and identifying where we are with this. Um, are you able to see the presentation? Me personally? Yes. Um, Do you need Justin to share that? I mean, I, if you allow me to share my screen. Um, However you'd like to work that between them. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I, just, I, have a, I just have a condensed version that's a little more appealing to a presentation than kind of reading the document itself. Very good. Well, th uh, everyone, this is Kyle Duell. Uh, he just graduated from the Clemson University City and Regional Planning Program. So uh, we give him a big shout out and congratulations to that. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kyle. All right. So like you said, I am Kyle Duell. I appreciate everyone uh, being here and listening to me speak and present these results. Um, since we're running a little behind, I guess we can just dive in. So just let me share my screen. And we can do this thing. All right, let me just present this. Oop, wrong one. All right, can everyone see this? 
it's a yeah. bit difficult for me to get a, a gauge of the room, but I'm seeing a lot of head nods, so that's good. All right. So, um, like I'm sure they already told you, uh, this has been a comprehensive plan analysis looking at the 10 county comprehensive plans for upstate South Carolina, in addition to the two city plans for the cities of Greenville and Spartanburg. And I, like we have said, am Kyle Dole, and the year is 2021. Oh, it's not letting me do that. All right. So a very quick overview. Uh, we'll do a little introduction, kind of talk a little bit about uh, the project itself, which I'm sure they may have covered in my absence. Um, we'll look at some of the county snapshots. Uh, then we'll go to the to the meat of this, which would be the, the matrix results broken down by element. Um, but there's been a special focus on the transportation element of these comprehensive plans. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of uh, some land use analysis that we did with the help of uh, Sintera, and we'll kind of discuss the conclusions that I came to uh, after looking at all these plans. And then, of course, naturally, we'll talk about the limitations of the research itself. So number one, the introduction. Uh, so like we've said, the focus is to kind of look at these 10 upstate plans uh, so we can highlight some regional trends, identify some areas of collaboration. Um, these plans are kind of done in a lot of different ways. Uh, we, we try to focus just on the, the elements the nine or rather the eight elements um, that are required by South Carolina law to be involved in comprehensive plans. Um, it's, it's a little difficult to do the priority investment one, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So that one was not included. Um, also, we did, uh, we looked just at the plan documents. Uh, we tried not to do any supplemental or substitute documents that were, you know, not really included in these main documents. Um, and like I had also mentioned, there was a special focus on the transportation elements. Um, so 10 at the top, kind of the mission of our organization is to kind of have these types of meetings, have these types of presentations uh, and discuss uh, with stakeholders in the upstate region about how we can, you know, achieve planning goals together and collaborate uh, in our mission to create, you know, a safer, healthier and better uh, area for all the residents here in the upstate. Um, so... This is not the first time this project has been done. Uh, it was done before in, I believe, 2016 by a, a group of Clemson graduate students. So I am following in their footsteps. Um, but their project, as we'll discuss a little later, seemed to have an impact on uh, comprehensive planning in the upstate. So despite some limitations that this project has, the hope is, once again, uh, it will be useful uh, as we continue to address planning-related issues in the upstate region. So the county snapshots, just a very quick rundown of what they are. Um, they're just kind of one page summaries, just so you can, if you're not familiar with a county in the area, we'll get you up to speed fairly quickly. Um, the, the idea is just kind of sharing that kind of information with the general public to kind of promote discussion and you know, generate some policy ideas, getting a background on these counties. Um, so they include where the county is, um, the population figures for kind of the most populous areas in the counties. Um, we'll discuss a little bit about why some of the numbers may not be the same. The numbers were taken just directly from the plans themselves. Uh, some of the cities, as we know, kind of straddle county lines. Uh, so some of the comprehensive plans had different numbers for those cities. Uh, we'll talk about points of interest in these areas. And then the biggest discussion we'll have uh, will be the themes from each county's plan. So we'll go alphabetical, starting with uh, Abbeville County. Um, basically, uh, Abbeville County was really focused on land conservation, uh, really, really focused on getting some industrial recruitment into the area. Uh, like a lot of counties, they want to do some infrastructure improvements. Uh, they want to maintain the cultural heritage and the rural fabric of the county and, uh, and affordable housing and code enforcement, which was, a, which was an interesting uh, aspect of their comprehensive plan that was not present in a lot of plans. And then we'd, uh, we talked about Anderson County. Uh, Anderson County with, you know, very focused on an economic base, um, protecting their natural resources, Land use controls for affordable housing yet again, uh, and alternative transportation. And like I said, I mean, a lot of these are kind of more so, they don't really lend themselves to this type of presentation. Uh, we're all rarely, you know, fairly familiar with a lot of counties in the area, but it's kind of just to, to give us some context in the areas that we're talking about. And Anderson County was funny in that they, uh, they talked about census county divisions instead of municipalities or cities. So that was a little interesting quirk of their comprehensive plan. Cherokee County uh, was another county. Their last plan update was in 2004. Uh, so that we'll discuss that a little later, but some of these, a lot of the counties, the, the times in which the plans were, uh, were developed, were, there's a decent range to them. 
Um, but still, even back in 2004, uh, Cherokee County was focused on responsible and sustainable development patterns. Um, you know, making those type of infrastructure improvements, which will be a common theme through here, and uh, diversifying the local economy and industrial recruitment, which will also be another theme. Greenville County. Uh, Greenville County recently posted, uh, or recently rather published their county comprehensive plan, and then we were able to get a, a hold of a draft for the city of Greenville's plan uh, this fall. So that is a draft that has yet to be approved, or at least when I analyzed it at the time, it was a draft. Um, I guess, I mean, we can kind of skip through the, the key themes for each plan because the meat of this that we want to talk about is kind of a, the, the matrix analysis. So we have Greenwood County, um, Lawrence County, of course, Okoni County, Pickens County, which is was my home until Wednesday or Tuesday. Uh, so shout out to Pickens County for, for being my home for two years. Spartanburg County, and we did the city as well. And lastly, Union County, which uh, was nice to say that they didn't have a plan last time and they actually were nice enough to send me a draft of their new plan in the fall. So we got to add Pickens County, or I'm sorry, Union County. So what was the comprehensive plan analysis? How was it done? So the purpose of this was to kind of, to guide our assessment of these multiple planning documents and how they approached uh, the, the planning elements that are on the right of the screen. Um, like I discussed, um, the priority investment was not included only because Counties kind of tackle that in a lot of different ways. It's difficult to kind of nail down a, a framework for the matrix to kind of to grade them all under the same uh, the same umbrella. So that's why that was not included. Um, also, South Carolina recently passed a law that was going to require a resiliency element to comprehensive plans. Uh, so that is not present in this iteration of the project. But in, if there are future ones, I'm sure it will be uh, included in that. And uh, like we had mentioned a little bit. This is not the first time this project has been done. Uh, so the matrix was actually developed uh, by the original Clemson research team. Um, and I was lucky enough to kind of just fall into the matrix already being completed for me, which was very fortunate. Uh, but some changes were made by me, just kind of, you know, way things are worded, adding some elements um, or some sub, uh, some sub elements rather uh, that were not present in the original, um, the original iteration of this research project. This is just a, a nice look at uh, at kind of what the range of when plans were created, and also kind of comparing them to uh, to the last research project. So, almost every single county had made changes to the comprehensive plan uh, that was looked at last project. Um, so, I almost basically looked at completely new plans compared to the people that did this originally. And like I had mentioned, as you can see, that's popping off the screen in red. That Union County did not have a comprehensive plan. Uh, for the last time this was done. So it was really nice that we got to uh, got to look at a plan from them. And then also, like we had mentioned um, from the top, that we added the city of Greenville and the city of Spartanburg this year. And then the asterisks just denote the fact that, um, like I had discussed a little bit in the county snapshots, that those were drafts, that they weren't, uh, they weren't fully approved documents at the time that I had looked at them. So this is our matrix legend. Uh, this was just a, kind of a grading scale, just to make it a lot easier to do all of this stuff for all of these plans. Um, it goes from essentially uh, just mentioning or describing an issue all the way to establishing monitoring uh, and metrics for evaluation. Uh, A's were obviously very common. F's were a lot less common. Um, and we also, I mean, it was just trying to look at the level of commitment they were placing uh, onto uh, each sub element within these, uh, these required elements. Um, you know, kind of following the, the principles of comprehensive planning, um, looking at, you know, data analysis, current conditions, how are we analyzing what's existing on the ground at the moment? Um, what are our goals? Are we setting goals for these types of things? Uh, are we laying out methods to achieve these goals? And then how we plan on monitoring uh, our achievement of those goals or our progress towards those goals. So we won't really talk about these types of slides because it's fairly bland. This is kind of more for if you want to go back and kind of dig deep into the nitty gritty details. But these slides will be the slides that we dive into because this is a lot easier for us. Um, so in the terms of the population themes throughout the, uh, the comprehensive plans, um, very focused on minority populations, growth management, especially, as you can see from uh, that bar kind of outpacing every other bar in the graph and, uh, and aging. Um, so uh, a lot of counties were especially not even just mentioning growth management, but really setting out goals and ways to achieve those goals in reference to growth management. 
And um, some glare, not some glaring issues, but some issues that I had noticed um, was that densification was not really discussed at all um, in the population element. Uh, part of this, my opinion on this is that uh, I think it was just that dense discussions on densification fit a lot better into, uh, into other elements, uh, especially, you know, maybe like natural resources, uh, economics, things like that, housing. Um, and there was uh, a lack of discussion, I would say, on a, a concentra concentrated poverty and then segregation of enclaves. So there was mention of poverty in some of the plans, but not really a, a deeper analysis on where it is and, uh, and kind of the characteristics of those populations. Moving on to the economic matrix. This was a, this was a big one. So we can kind of fly through these. Now we get to the themes. Um, so the dominant focuses of the economics was uh, industrial recruitment, definitely, uh, income and wages, uh, education and developing the workforce, uh, providing increased employment opportunities uh, to local residents, developing uh, commercial opportunities as well, and, uh, and, and supporting local businesses. So um, there was a huge focus on just bringing opportunity into the region, uh, whether it was through, you know, in bringing in industrial, uh, you know, land uses, um, supporting local businesses and entrepreneurship, things of the short. Um, as you can see, too, from the from the graph that we're looking at, industrial recruitment and small businesses uh, were huge focuses of these comprehensive plans. Um, the, the upstate plans, a lot of these counties plan to grow in the future, and what they need to do to kind of accommodate that growth, part of that is providing economic opportunity, opportunity rather, uh, for those new residents. Uh, I just wanted to do also give a quick shout out to Union County uh, in this part for uh, they were kind of one of the only counties that was focused on uh, quality and accessibility of broadband internet uh, and how that impacts the economic climate. Uh, it's, I would say, especially relevant to today as I didn't have internet or, uh, or electricity access. So the lack of, you know, providing that type to as many people, providing that service rather to as many people as you can, uh, can have a huge impact on the economic opportunity that you provide for your residents. And uh, I will say that I was a little bit shocked by how little, um, you know, utility development was discussed in an economic context. Um, it, it was obviously discussed in the community facilities part of, uh, of the research and the plans, but uh, I was a bit surprised that there wasn't any um, kind of, you know, no connections made between the access uh, to utilities and how that relates to economic growth, especially in terms of industrial recruitment, you know, creating small businesses, expanding, you know, commercial areas. So then uh, the next matrix will be uh, natural resources. So as we all know, since uh, I believe all of us have spent some time in the upstate, the upstate has a, an abundance of natural resources, which is very good for us. Um, so each plan was very focused on uh, land conservation and, uh, and especially surface water. Um, Especially in these two, especially from the, the angle of uh, environmental health and recreation, um, you know, it's one thing to kind of just have these types of resources, but we can use them in ways that doesn't mean we develop them um, and kind of create a nice synergy between land development and these natural resources while keeping them, you know, as pristine as we can. Um, similar to the kind of economics, they, they want to make these, you know, the counties want to make themselves attractive. Uh, not only for economic opportunity, but for residents to move into and even tourists. So uh, natural resources is a great way to do just that. Um, I'll be honest though, I, the, the concept of surface water was a bit ambiguous. Um, it, it's difficult because there's a lot of really nice, you know, lakes and such in the upstate. Um, but it, it kind of, surface water can break down into a lot of things uh, with water quality, you know, water supply and things like that. Um, so I would say that there, there was a little bit less focus on water supply and water quality instead of just kind of discussing that there is surface water in the upstate. Um, and I will say that when, in the box that says factors that I identified as weaknesses, um, invasive species is kind of like a luxury factor. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing that it wasn't really mentioned. If anything, that sounds like a good thing. Um, it's also maybe not the best kind of gauge for, for a countywide document. Um, invasive species, you know, a lot of it might be very context specific. So, you know, maybe Greenville County isn't as worried about invasive species as maybe some of the you know, smaller regions within the county itself. And, uh, and also, like I had mentioned that I made some changes to the matrix. Uh, one of the changes I had made 
which is just something that, that piqued my interest, was uh, in Greenwood County's comprehensive plan. Uh, they discussed the concept of urban forest. Um, and that's something we learn a lot about in, a, in planning school is, uh, is ways to kind of, you know, provide amenities into urban areas, um, which kind of tend to be, you know, highly developed, a lot of impervious surface. And uh, it was nice to see that there, there was a little bit of attention paid to, to the concept of, of the urban forest. Okay, so moving on. Community facilities. So themes for the community facilities uh, elements was uh, without a doubt a focus on recreation and public parks. Uh, it ties in a little bit to what I had mentioned in the in the natural resources is that um, you know counties realize that the upstate is naturally a very beautiful place. Uh, they don't want to just bulldoze all of that stuff. They want to use it. They want to see it as a resource. Uh, as itself, uh, especially as a way to attract tourism and residents. So um, a lot of the plans focused heavily on uh, on park development and uh, and creating recreational opportunities. Um, I'm sorry. So uh, the factors that were mentioned in each plan, uh, water utilities, like I had mentioned, is another theme, uh, sanitary sewer, schools, obviously, every every comprehensive plan wants to wants to discuss the education in the area and uh, fire service, which is nice to see. So um, but factors I identified as weaknesses. Um, dispatch centers was kind of something that was a little bit ambiguous throughout all the plans. Um, it might have just been a one-off mention. Um, that's it's not the biggest deal in the world, I would say. Um, but one, two things that uh, I've kind of, a theme that I've discussed throughout this has been, uh, you know, energy and water conservation and then the telecommunications. Um, I did think it was, especially because these plans uh, are a little bit more updated than the, than the last iteration of this project, that uh, there wasn't as much of a focus on telecommunications. And maybe that will change, especially due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because we've all seen the, the importance of being able to access the internet and, um, and how providing that type of opportunity can expand um, you know, economic opportunity to residents in each county. Uh, I will say though that, I mean, the community facilities, uh, these elements within comprehensive plans feel more like a, an inventory list than any of the others. There, there's not a lot of, you know, analysis or relationship connecting to be made in these. Um, but I mean, it kind of, that kind of just is what it is. It's the nature of, you know, just kind of discussing what facilities the community has. Um, and again, uh, something that piqued my interest uh, within the community facilities themes or elements rather was that Greenwood County uh, was one of the only counties, was the only county rather, uh, to discuss renewable energy. Um, and general conservation of looking at how county facilities, uh, you know, consume energy, how that relates to, you know, the impact of development on the environment and how ways that the county itself and public uh, entities um, can reduce their carbon footprint through uh, utilizing renewable energy. So that would be something that maybe in the next project would be something to look out for. So cultural resources. Uh, the upstate is uh, is rife with uh, historic historical sites. Um, there's a lot of history in the area. There's a lot of, I mean, it goes back almost to the founding of the country. Um, a lot of settlers moving from the north down south to make a new life for themselves. Um, this, I will say that this was a, a tricky element to kind of analyze, mostly because it it's kind of a combination of of being straightforward, of discussing, you know, there's buildings that have historical value, but then when you get into things like the arts and the arts can be a little bit uh, ambiguous. Um, that's why for me personally, there, there's two, two of the, uh, the you know, factors I identified as weaknesses were uh, arts incubators and public art, essentially it's only because, you know, there we have public art, we have art incubators, we have the performing arts, you know, we have museums. There's a bunch of different ways to tackle the arts and, and providing that type of cultural resource that um, it, it's difficult to kind of, to say there's a right or wrong way to do it or, or a right or wrong way to focus on these kind of things. Um, I will say that the, the, the large focus of these uh, these elements was definitely on historical sites and how they contribute to kind of the fabric and the history of these communities. Um, a lot of focus on historic preservation, on how to kind of, you know, the upstate is kind of rural by nature and a lot of these areas um, in the future, they, you know, they project growth and it's kind of trying to to grow and urbanize in a way that doesn't sacrifice, you know, that rural character that is so, you know, kind of synonymous with the upstate region. And uh, something that I mentioned in, in this, in the factors that uh, as weaknesses was the sports leagues and clubs. I just, uh, I mean, this is more of like a personal thing for me, I will say, uh, is that I'm, I'm a big sports guy. And I had talked a lot about providing recreational opportunities, uh, but I thought that it was interesting that there wasn't a lot of mention of, uh, of sports leagues or anything of the sort in, a, in the cultural resources. 
So housing. Housing was a very, very important one. Um, as you can see from the graph, affordable housing was dominated this, this element for pretty much every single comprehensive plan. Um, I think the word affordable was probably the most used word in every single one of these plans, especially in tandem with the word affordable housing. Um, there was a little bit of, of interpretation needed for um, kind of dividing. So you see the, you see mixed use is, is on um, in the percentage of plans and factors with goals and methods by, by factor. So it was, it was very common for people to mention that they had goals and ways to achieve those goals related to mixed use. But I would say that a lot of, not a lot of it, but some of that had to be interpretation on my part. Um, wasn't exactly maybe using the term mixed use, but describing mixed use. Um, so I would say that there was a little bit of subjectivity that that kind of crept its way into to that type of sub-element. Um, I will say it was also interesting for me personally, uh, learning about the concepts of, of cost burden and uh, the relationship between income and housing costs and how kind of unfortunately prevalent that is in the upstate the upstate area. Um, I will say that factors identified as weaknesses for me personally. Um, you know, the transit and vehicle ownership was was a sub element that was identified by the last research group uh, as something that was important. And not many not many comprehensive plans really touched on that concept. Um, you know, it's one thing to provide to provide housing for people, but they need to kind of you know be able to move away from their house. And especially with a lot of the ways that the upstate is built up, that we'll discuss in the transportation section, is that you know access to, to multimodal transportation is not as good as it needs to be or, or the county or counties rather want to be. Um, so I thought there would be more of a discussion between, you know, vehicle ownership and trans and transportation in general with, uh, with housing. Um, there was also, I would say, a lack of discussion on manufactured housing standards. Um, there was talk of manufactured housing. A lot of counties mentioned, you know, the rate of, or the, rather the, the number of people in the county that live in manufactured housing, uh, but there wasn't much talk on on, you know, the standards that this housing, uh, excuse me, is being held to. And then additionally, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, I figured that, you know, especially with, with these plans being newer and kind of, you know, a lot of planning themes, you know, around the 2010s into, you know, you know, at recently being on sustainability and energy efficiency, that, that there wasn't more talk of this, um, within the housing element. But, uh, but it was nice to see that there was a lot of talk of diversification. Um, I would say that diversification and affordable housing uh, were kind of correlated in that uh, a lot of the ways that counties proposed to tackle the affordable housing problems was to create a, a diverse housing stock. So land use. So land use. Um, naturally, future land use was a, was a large part of the land use element. Um, same thing with uh, zoning districts. Um, so basically a, a lot of these, you know, every county is expecting to grow for the most part. Um, but a big focus has to be on, um, on, you know, how that growth happens and it's important to plan that out. So um, it's no surprise in addition to this kind of, you know, expecting this growth that, uh, that highway corridors and residential expansion uh, were pretty, uh, were big main focuses as well. Um, you know, with I-85 and a lot of these these big highways uh, kind of creating the heart of the transportation infrastructure in the upstate, um, you know, it's important that we, you know, planners pay attention to how and how and where residential development happens and, and the relationship between that and and you know these these large uh, arterial highways. And then so things I identified as weaknesses uh, was environmental sensitivity and hazard areas, especially. Um, there wasn't much of a discussion on. On kind of identifying the best places for development a lot of it had to do with you know placing residential development and kind of where it was most convenient and kind of separating it from a lot of other uses high intensity uses you know especially industrial uh, but there wasn't a lot of talk on, on finding you know the best you know uh, introducing the environmental aspect into that discussion i would say all right and our special focus transportation so uh, the themes for transportation, every county wants to make road and infrastructure improvements. That is kind of the nature of the game. Um, also, a lot of counties discussed, you know, established goals for, uh, for public transit. Um, in addition, uh, thirdly, rather, uh, demand management and safety was, was a big focus. Uh, a lot of it has to do with widening highways. Um, the upstate, you know, as we kind of know, a central theme that I've kind of touched on, it, 
projected growth is going to lead to, you know, a, a need for, you know, economic opportunity. There's going to be more people that come into the area, which is going to put more strain on our transportation network. Uh, so it was good to see that a lot of the county plans were paying attention to this, projecting this need, and, uh, and kind of discussing ways to handle this new demand management. Um, also, uh, which is good, was a regional, a, a focus on regional connectivity. Um, you know, the transportation infrastructures for these counties don't exist in a vacuum within, you know, the municipal borders of those counties. Uh, so it was nice to see that there was uh, attention paid to the fact that uh, that a lot of these roads and, and transit systems, you know, will cross county lines. And uh, things that I identified as weaknesses within uh, this element was uh, was parking. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of issues that can arise through parking, uh, whether the lack of or maybe even too much parking. Um, so it was interesting, I would say. But also parking could also be a factor um, of the fact that these are county level plans. Uh, county level plans might not be as focused on on the amount of parking that is provided throughout the county, uh, but instead on, on larger things like, you know, general road improvements and, uh, and connectivity of the transit systems. And then in addition, air quality. Um, there was some discussion in some plans, which was good to see. Uh, and it, when it was mentioned, it was mentioned heavily uh, with a lot of detail. But uh, when it wasn't mentioned, it, it, it was a pretty glaring uh, omission, I would say. So um, like I had mentioned, there was a bit of a special focus on this research project for transportation. So we kind of tried to dive into the, the common concepts that were covered in each of the plans. Um, so there was a, a huge, huge uh, focus put on the importance of the relationship between transportation and land use. Um, you know, if, if you want to develop a residential area in a certain part of the county, you need to, to think about the fact that, okay, all of those people need to get somewhere, you know, they need uh, to have some type of connectivity to the rest of the county. And how, how does that materialize um, when you place, you know, commercial uses in an area, the same thing, how does the demand change on the surrounding infrastructure? Um, and also kind of how does providing transportation infrastructure incentivize development around that infrastructure and also the vice versa? So uh, a big, uh, a quote that I had mentioned or I've rather read in a lot of the plans was that a plan should anticipate and accommodate future needs, but uh, this, you know, two and three kind of play into each other, but the funding these types of large scale projects is kind of difficult, but it's very necessary. So while transportation planning should focus on this anticipation of future needs, a lot of the funding has to go to kind of current issues that are going on. Um, so that was definitely an issue that was identified throughout all of these elements. Um, every county kind of highlighted the importance of public transit, not even just the availability of it, but also the affordability of it. Uh, providing these types of opportunities for people is, uh, is deeply interconnected to, um, to affordable housing, to economic opportunity and all of those things. Um, a way to do, or a way to kind of, you know, increase this public, trans this public transit availability in a way is increasing connectivity. Um, so as you increase the connectivity of the transportation systems, uh, provides a lot of more, a lot more opportunity for multimodal traffic, and uh, just in general is a more efficient and safer system. Um, there are a lot of, you know, trails and greenways and and you know, good pedestrian areas across the Upstate, but there's there was a a big focus on connecting all of those areas together to create a, a much more efficient system. Um, and then lastly, um, there was a, a lot of attention paid to the to how important, uh, you know, railroad lines. Uh, the, the newly opened inland port and well-maintained highways are to uh, economic development in the region, just moving freight. Uh, a big focus on the economic uh, elements that I had mentioned was the industrial recruitment and kind of developing that industrial base in the area. And to have that, you need to have a surrounding infrastructure that can handle uh, the shipping needs that that creates. Um, so that was a big focus in these plans. So what were the objectives, especially across the region? So like I had mentioned, the number one, without a doubt, was promoting multimodal transportation systems. Um, you know, like a lot of us, I mean, me personally, I just got out of school. So a lot of what they, they tell us, you know, how urban sprawl kind of is a very inefficient system. Um, making everyone have to rely on a car to live their life uh, is not, A, it's not the most efficient and B, it's not the most equitable way to do things. Uh, so a lot of counties were, were focused on promoting a multimodal transportation system. And uh, like I also had mentioned, uh, a way to do this is to increase the connectivity and efficiency of existing systems. Um, if it's easy to walk around your neighborhood, but it's not easy to walk to, you know, where you need to be to maybe buy things or work, uh, it's nice that your neighborhood's walkable, but it doesn't really impact, you know, your greater accessibility to the rest of the community. Um, 
also, like I had mentioned last slide with the funding, uh, almost every county was discussing how to explore uh, alternative funding mechanisms. Uh, a lot of these came up was, um, you know, exactions, uh, increasing sales tax, things of the like, to try to generate more revenue so that uh, a lot of these more ambitious transportation plans uh, for the future can, can have at least some semblance of a funding base. And uh, with these future projects was incorporating more pedestrian friendly designs, um, you know, sidewalks, bump outs, things of the sort, uh, you know, safer intersections uh, so that not only can we provide, you know, the, the foundation for pedestrians, but we want to provide a safe environment for them to be able to utilize that foundation. And then uh, lastly, just continuing to work with regional council of governments on, uh, on regional transportation planning. Um, those governments, as you know, most of us here will know, uh, they provide a lot of assistance in transportation planning, and especially with creating long-term transportation plans. So, you know, working intimately with them to make sure regionally uh, a lot of these goals and, uh, and objectives are being met and everyone kind of has a say and is understanding that we're all on the same page. And um, so the next section, we'll be looking at some of the, some maps and graphs that we, uh, that we made uh, discussing land use in the upstate. Um, this is more of a kind of logistical slide that needs to happen. But uh, I just wanted to give um, a quick shout out to Catherine Amadon from uh, Sintera. Uh, she was really helpful in, uh, in helping us here at 10 at the Top create these visuals uh, so that we could understand land use and how kind of, uh, you know, development is going on in the upstate. So this I right now is, uh, this is our future land use map. Um, it has that big draft over it because um, we're still kind of waiting uh, to get some data from Pickens and Spartanburg County. Um, it's just been, you know, Spartanburg County recently transitioned all their GIS data onto a new, uh, a new website online and Pickens County is in the middle of a, of a comprehensive plan overhaul themselves. So uh, in the future, that will not have the draft and we'll have a lot more data on that. Um, but this is kind of just a look at, at where future development is projected to happen in the upstate. Uh, it's just an interesting way to look at, at uh, what the upstate might look like in the future and how these counties are kind of you know, how they think the future is going to go is, is going to impact how they act in the present. Uh, so this is very important information for us to have. And then uh, this is what 2016 land cover. Um, just kind of talking about how the upstate region, you know, what the land looks like. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, developed land within Greenville and Spartanburg counties, which we would type, you know, expect because of the cities of Greenville and Spartanburg. Uh, and especially to, if you want to look down uh, to Anderson, uh, there's a decent amount of developed land in Anderson as well. So this is um, discuss a little bit of this is an easier way to look at that development. Um, you know, it, it paints a similar picture to the last one, uh, except it's focused, you know, only on that developed land. Uh, once again, you can see that Greenville and Spartanburg County um, kind of dominate the, the map itself because of those more urban areas uh, surrounding the cities of Greenville and Spartanburg. This is the land cover change, um, you know, in the, the 15 years between 2001 and 2016, getting a look at how the, the, the land itself has changed. Um, we're seeing, you know, a theme here arise between Greenville and, and Spartanburg. A lot of development in the upstate is happening in those two areas. Um, a lot of those cities present a lot of economic opportunity. Economic, economic opportunity, you know, tends to bring in more residents. More residents tend to lead to more, uh, more development. And then some graphs. Um, so this is kind of, you know, just a way to look at or easier to visualize a lot of those maps. Um, just kind of looking at, you know, how developed land is changing. Greenville and Spartanburg are kind of running away with it. But also, like I had mentioned in, a, in the first map, that Anderson as well uh, has gained a lot of developed land uh, in the years between 2001 and 2016. Um, but in general, I mean, a lot of the other counties... It's kind of sticking true to the to the sense that uh, the upstate at its heart is a very rural area. Um, you know, there's a lot of natural bounty here. Uh, there are pockets of urban development, um, but in general, a lot of the land here is is still yet to be developed. And then, um, kind of looking at what type of land is being taken and turned into this developed land, um, a lot of it is going to end up just being forests, which is unfortunate in a sense but um you know this is kind of one of the central tenets of, of planning and kind of the decisions we have to make is is 
how we maintain and kind of navigate that relationship between, you know, our our duty of, of natural and environmental stewardship, but also providing, you know, opportunity and development to, to the people that live here. And uh, this is also looking at a developed land and also impervious surface in each of the counties. Um, as you can see, once again, that Greenville and Spartanburg County are kind of, you know, the, the most developed counties in the upstate with the highest level of impervious surface. Uh, Anderson, you know, lagging behind in the third. And, but it, I mean, a lot of these counties, there is not, you know, while there is a decent amount of development, you know, the impervious surface is not, you know, it's not dominating that development, which is, you know, somewhat as someone who has a background in, in you know, green stormwater infrastructure and kind of managing how much impervious surface development can create, uh, that, that is, you know, encouraging to see. And then this is kind of looking at that increase um, over that same time period. So Spartanburg actually had a larger increase than Greenville uh, in impervious surface with a, with a similar look at increase in developed area. Um, so that is, that's an interesting uh, finding that we found from the data itself. So what are my general conclusions? Um, general conclusions from the data, I would just say that a lot of, a lot of goals are focused on anticipating changes in land use, uh, especially from the context of, of residential development. Uh, counties have been growing fairly quickly in this area. Um, the, and a lot of the planning has been focused on how to handle this residential development, how to provide equitable and affordable housing uh, for those people. And also a look at, at how existing conditions will influence those changes and, and kind of the ripple effects of how those changes uh, will then create new existing conditions, which will then influence further changes. Um, and a big thing uh, and something that I have kind of tried to thread throughout here is that the interaction between economic development and sustainability, um, you know, at its heart, economic development is going to consume resources. Uh, the upstate has a lot of those resources, but there is a, you know, a responsibility of the planners in the area to create an environment and situation where, you know, there's a balance between the two of them. Um, it's also nice to see that there's you know, ample opportunity for collaboration uh, between planners across the region, especially within these regional transportation, transportation goals, rather. Um, a lot of that has to do with how interconnected a lot of the transportation system is in the area and how reliant um, a lot of counties are on similar roads and the development along those roads. And uh, plans have certainly evolved uh, since the original research project. Um, I couldn't really bring in you know, that whole project into this, but. It, and I believe I believe it is on the tenant ten at the top website. But uh, if you if you compare the two of them, um, there is a lot more goals and methods uh, kind of presented in these new versions of the plan. So it is nice to see that the conclusions that the previous research project came to uh, were kind of incorporated into new iterations of those comprehensive plans. And uh, I would say it was probably none more evident than Greenwood County's uh, Greenwood County's plan. When if you, you know, after this presentation is over and in, in future, if you want to look at, you know, dig into the matrix, uh, Greenwood County checked a lot of boxes throughout. And I, I thought for me personally, uh, it seemed as though they, that county had taken to heart a lot of the conclusions and, you know, advice that the last research project uh, had come to. So kind of breaking the conclusions down a little bit better um, through e throughout each element rather. Uh, so. With the economic elements, this a lot of the discussion was just on providing opportunity. Um, every county wants to be a county where people want to live and work in, um, and it makes it a lot easier when you can do both of those things in the same county. Uh, and also, another thing that I had mentioned was broadband internet access was something that I thought personally was lacking throughout. Um, but Union County was the w one county that put a major focus on kind of linking the the linking together internet access and economic development. And I will say that uh, there was, I think there was a lack of attention to equitable opportunity and discussion of poverty. So while opportunity was a major focus, there was less of a focus on how that opportunity is available to different sects of the population. Um, and also kind of a discussion on, on how that opportunity can kind of alleviate poverty um, and how, you know, providing that opportunity it's one thing to provide the opportunity, but it's a different thing entirely that everyone has an equal chance at that opportunity. Uh, discussing in the, the natural resources, uh, there was, without a doubt, every county is very, very conscious of uh, their responsibility to protect the upstate's natural resources. Um, a lot of this comes down to protecting water resources, you know, providing quality water and 
to residents and also kind of development not impacting the quality of that water and the quality of these resources. Um, you know, the water isn't just used to drink. A lot of it, you know, recreation opportunities are abundant with the natural resources within all of these counties, but it's kind of finding that balance between creating the opportunity for people to enjoy it, but not to kind of degrade it. And lastly, uh, renewable energy. I thought that renewable energy was uh, Greenwood County, like I had mentioned, had, had put a focus on renewable energy and not like not going into the research project, I would say me personally with the bias of like needs to be renewable energy, but after seeing the fact that it wasn't talked about a lot in a lot of the, the plans in the aftermath, the conclusion that I had come to that it, it was something that I, I thought was was definitely missing from a lot of the plans discussions. Uh, community facilities, like I had mentioned when we talked about it, it's very straightforward, kind of just more of an inventory list, but a lot of that had to do with water resources, um, you know, looking at water, uh, sewer lines, things of the sort, and kind of how those resources are managed and, uh, and utilized throughout each county. Uh, once again, also the telecommunications aspect uh, was not discussed much in the community facilities aspect. And I had mentioned the kind of the importance of it in the economic element, and I had thought we would kind of come around to it in the community facilities aspect, but it wasn't there as much as I thought it would be. Um, and cultural resources, there's just there's so much opportunity for historical preservation in the area. There's a lot of history uh, within the rural context of these counties. Um, so there's great recreational opportunity that goes along with that as well. Um, arts, like I had mentioned, were kind of a mixed bag in how they were discussed. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do the arts and to kind of promote the arts in your, your county. Uh, and like also, like I'd mentioned, there's really not a right or wrong way to do so. It's just kind of each county has their own way that they wanted to do it. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, a little a little personal point in, the, in what should be more objective research is that there was a lack of discussion of sports leagues. Um, it just seemed like there was a lot of talk on, you know, childhood education and providing recreation and things of the sort, but not a lot of discussion on, a, on sports leagues and, and things of the sort. Um, housing. Also, like I had mentioned, acutely aware of this need for affordable housing. Um, also, like I had mentioned, too, that diversity and diversifying the housing stock was the way that a lot of counties wanted to uh, wanted to attack that. Um, it was interesting that one of the sub-elements within the matrix was um, kind of the regulatory barriers to providing affordable housing. And I thought that that wasn't approached uh, in a similar way. It was definitely the counties were more focused on just diversifying housing stock than looking at any uh, existing regulatory or zoning barriers to affordable housing. And uh, I was shocked a little bit by the, the amount of cost burden residents in the region. Um, that is definitely an issue that a lot of the plans highlighted. And, uh, and it, they you know, were talked about goals and methods to achieve those goals in relation to it. Um, but it was a conclusion that a, a lot of residents in the upstate are currently cost burden uh, with housing. Transportation. Uh, we talked about this a decent amount, uh, more so than the other ones, but, and I'm, as I'm sure everyone, you know, sitting here knows that I-85 is pretty much, you know, very, it's central to the upstate transportation network. Um, a lot of, a lot of improvement projects and, uh, and discussion of, you know, future infrastructure improvements had to do with I-85, whether it was I-85 interchanges or I-85 itself. Um, this connectivity is central basically to every goal that transportation uh, the transportation elements we're, we're putting forth. Um, just creating an efficient network that is equitable and accessible um, was kind of, I mean, that's the goal of transportation planning, but it was nice to see that each county was kind of, you know, zeroed in on connectivity as being a central part of everything they wanted to do relating to transportation. Uh, this kind of, you know, plays into the fact that multimodal systems are desired by every county for an absolute variety of reasons. And, uh, and public transportation systems, I would say, would benefit from a more regional perspective. Um, some counties lacked public transportation systems in general at all. And uh, kind of increasing connectivity between desirable locations across, uh, you know, the region, I think would be a good way to kind of promote a public transportation system. And uh, the limitations of the research. So, like I had mentioned, and we showed a little bit in a chart, uh, the plans are just from different time periods. Um, so there's less of an issue, I would say, for this iteration of the project compared to the original. But uh, just essentially the, the plans are kind of, they were done in varying contexts. So um, grading them all with the same matrix across the same scale might not be, you know, as fair. I mean, it's not as fair as possible, but uh, I would say that it's definitely still a useful exercise. 
Um, in addition, uh, so this time it was the analysis was done by an individual instead of a team. So, you know, naturally my subjective bias will creep in. There's no kind of checks or balances on, you know, how I'm reading the plans, how I'm viewing them, how I'm interpreting each, uh, each term. Like I had mentioned uh, with the, you know, the concept of mixed use was just an example of maybe not the term mixed use being used, but, you know, me having, you know, being currently being in school, learning about the stuff and, you know, reading different phrases being like, okay, like they're talking about mixed use. So it was kind of somewhat unavoidable that my personal bias would creep in. And I will say uh, another branch of this limitation is that I'm not the one who created the matrix. Um, so the people who did this project the last time, the matrix was created by them for them uh, in a way that allowed them to check each other's biases. Uh, so naturally someone who was not involved in the creation of the matrix, uh, maybe not utilizing it in the same way that they did or maybe to the best uh, of you know, the potential that it could have been. And then lastly, uh, plans just kind of in general followed varying formats and structures. Some were very straightforward of just, you know, population element, economic element, natural resources element. Some of them were very visual heavy um, that focused more on, you know, cultivating a vision of what the future of the county might look like more so than kind of really focused on that rigid structure of the providing information about each of these elements. Not to say that there's a right or wrong way to do it, but just in terms of analyzing those more kind of free form graphic heavy documents might not using the matrix which was a very rigid way to do it might not have been you know the best way to evaluate those plans specifically and that would be all for me i know i talked a lot so i appreciate everyone uh, everyone <laughs> following along with me and that's just some reference stuff great well thank you kyle that was uh Excellent presentation, very well done. I know a lot of uh, a lot of hard work went into that, uh, a lot of time, sweat, and effort, uh, and, and Catherine as well, and the folks at Centera, um, wonderful job there. Um, so I guess what we will do, um, if anybody has a question, um, we will open up the floor. Um, Justine, are they are folks able to to free will talk if they if they want to just unmute themselves yep. to do so? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I also, I see that there was some that popped in the chat. Um, for me, it's a little weird. Sometimes Zoom doesn't give you that little help bar. That so I, I, I'm now looking at, I can just, I can run through those questions. Yeah. I think that one was from me. Um, Catherine answered it, but if you want to go ahead and touch on it a little bit, I'll go ahead and read the questions for everybody. Um, in, in regards to the future land use maps that you showed, um, can give us give us an idea since since each county and each jurisdiction has their own sort of terminology and methodology for how they view certain land use uh, measurements. Um, what were some of the challenges in trying to normalize um, and adjust each of those to to speak to each other? Um, yeah, I would say, if I'm honest, I would say Catherine's answer that's in the chat is probably the perfect answer. Um, for me personally, my role in, in that map was kind of just more collecting data itself. Uh, I will say though that I would say that um, I think they did a really good job, like she had mentioned, of trying to mimic the 2015 effort. Um, they, the analysis is kind of, uh, it was difficult to, I would say, you know what, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just refer to Catherine's answer. I think she said it best. I don't, I don't really think I need to kind of rewrite what she said. Um, but I do think that's a really good question and definitely something to, uh, to kind of consider when looking at a lot of the data in, in the project itself. Um, so I do see that there was a question that, uh, that Phil put in um, that I see. Uh, so it says that I identified weaknesses for each of the elements, but can I give two or three major weaknesses that upstate communities can focus on over the next few years? Um, I would say that something, you know, a thread that I kind of tried to weave throughout um, was that kind of attention to internet access. Um, I would say one of the big things that we learn in school is kind of, you know, how important those telecommunications are now and how important they will be in the future. Um, and I would say that one of the glaring weaknesses of the comprehensive plans was there was not a lot of talk of internet access and how that relates to providing economic opportunity for a lot of uh, people in the area. Um, I would also say that um, uh, something that I'd also mentioned too was kind of the relationship between this economic development and poverty. Um, you know, there was discussion of 
of affordable housing and cost burden renters and owners. And there wasn't a ton of discussion, you know, linking that to like the economic, you know, portion of the plans and how they want to provide more opportunity for those people. You know, it was kind of more about just bringing in industries and kind of things like that and kind of supporting small businesses, but it wasn't as much of a talk about, you know, those, you know, the exact people that they mentioned in the affordable who are suffering from the affordable housing issues and who are cost burdened. Uh, I just thought that there wasn't as much of, of a linkage between the two of them. And then uh, another question I see here that says, uh, when you looked at the growth patterns for the upstate, did you see the growth pattern is reflective of the goals and objectives within the individual comprehensive plans? Uh, I would say yes. Um, you know, a lot of them are just kind of focused along existing transportation networks. Uh, that is kind of the nature of the beast in general. Um, but I will say that uh, a lot of the focus was on, in the plans, this is, uh, you know, creating development around transportation networks and kind of bolstering the relationship between land use and transportation and understanding uh, that both of those things are, you know, intimately connected. And I think when you look at the maps, that definitely plays out within those maps. I see another question that's been uh, thrown into the chat here. It says, uh, is there opportunity moving forward for the upstate professional planners to discuss how they can collaborate to turn some of the plan elements into actual policies within the upstate counties to ensure the plans are followed? Uh, I would say without a doubt, um, you know, I think just even without even having to listen to me drone on, um, if you want, if you just look at the, the charts, um, T discussing the goals and methods, there's a lot of commonalities, uh, even looking at the matrix as well. A lot of the counties are focused on a lot of the same things and uh, maybe not even working on, you know, specific projects together, but taking inspiration from what other counties have done. Uh, I think there's, uh, you know, there's just a lot of opportunity um, for planners across the area to collaborate. And especially, um, you know, kind of piggybacking a little bit off that point, is that like I had mentioned at the at the top of the presentation, and that, that a lot of us know, a lot of cities are kind of either you know straddle county lines or, or kind of you know are on the edges and or you know connected in a lot of ways to cities across uh, you know within other counties, you know whether it's commuting patterns or or you know kind of, you know just for an example that's that's close to me, you know Clemson students and profession you know and professors living out in you know as far as Greenville or into easily things like that you know I think there's a there's a lot of connectivity between uh, how people interact with with counties in the upstate all right and I see another question from Nicole thank you Nicole uh, it says you mentioned some plans to discuss alternative funding options for transportation did most ideas include sales tax were there other ideas we should be exploring uh, I would say that the two most popular were definitely uh, a sales tax and um, and exactions. There was mention of of um, you know kind of discussing grant funding from the federal government, but I would say in terms of like what's probably you know maybe more actionable to to local and a regional perspective, um, sales taxes and uh, and exactions were definitely something. Um, that the plans that mentioned these alternative funding options, they mentioned both of those things heavily. Um, especially the exactions was an interesting one because it related right directly back to what a lot of plans had discussed, which was that relationship between land use uh, and development and the transportation network. You know, so providing that 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 ability to raise funds from that development that can directly, you know, lead to you know, more development for transportation specifically, I think uh, would be a nice way to go about that. And thank you for that question, Nicole. I appreciate that. Are there any other questions that we have? I don't see any more in the chat. Um, but before we go, I do want to say um, thank you to Kyle. Thank you to Dean and Tim at the top for funding this project, um, as well as Catherine Avedon and her team at Sentara for their work. Uh, Catherine, do you want to um, give a shout out to your team or give us any tidbits from your, your work you did on the project? Sure, I can say hi. 
Um, <laughs> thank you for like letting us help out. I'm glad that um, we were able to assist. I know um, COVID made it challenging and Kyle, great job on, on busting this out by yourself without a team. Thank and you. hopefully, um, you know, next next time this comes around, a team of um, Clemson students can work on this, but we're, we're happy to assist. And uh, I think Kyle and I both um, really tried to document some of what we were doing so it can be repeated next time a little bit easier. So yeah, um, yeah that was a goal we had and happy to be involved in the GIS um, analysis. And I really do encourage everybody to check out that link um, once this gets PDF'd and sent out to everybody of the EVA tool that's available on the National Land Cover Database um, website. It's very interactive and, you know, I was able to create a snapshot of all the 10 counties, but if you want to drill down to a specific county and play with the data and change the start and end date, um, it's very, it's very cool and um, worth, worth uh, your time. Yeah, and I guess um, if, if we're kind of going to wrap up a little bit, I just want to you know, say thank you. Um, I would say to 10 at the top, of course, um, you know, Dean and Justine. Uh, Michael and and Phil, uh, just for kind of you know the support and and all of the the logistical support, especially kind of doing this and uh, and kind of for believing in me. <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, that one man can do this. Uh, I tried to do my best work. Uh, it was definitely without a doubt an interesting project. Uh, I enjoyed learning a lot about the upstate. Um, you know, comprehensive planning is kind of maybe not the it's it's not the most exciting thing on the planet, but it is kind of the foundation of what we do as planners. It kind of sets the stage for a, a lot of more specific things that we do. So it, it was a really good opportunity and experience to kind of dive into to comprehensive planning within the upstate. Um, and also I would say to the to thank you to the steering committee. Um, there was a lot of good feedback, uh, a lot of assisting in, a, in, you know, getting documents, you know, nailing down people, you know, getting help interpreting things. Um, so everyone that was, it, you know, there was a lot of us, so I don't want to drone on with everybody's names. Um, I believe that the list is probably online somewhere, but everyone that was involved with the steering community um, was very helpful. And I really appreciate all that help. Uh, from, 10 at, from 10 at the top, we definitely want to thank, um, great job, Kyle. That's, that's, that's very compelling information. Uh, we, but we do want to thank Phil Lindler for working with Kyle throughout this uh, school year on creating the, the plan and resources. And um, thanks for thanking the steering committee. We appreciate them. And of course, Michael for Foreman for being a part of also getting the, getting the plan in motion. So much appreciation. Yeah, and, and Justine had put the, the link, I yes. believe to the, to the plan. Um, so this is kind of the version that we, we ran through today was a more condensed version that wasn't just walls of text for everyone. Um, but the the plan that will be, or the presentation rather document that will be online uh, is a much, you know, probably better resource to kind of dive in for yourself. And I'll send that out with a recap to everyone also, along with, um, we'll, we'll continue to put more links to the maps online as well. Yeah. Any final words, Phil? I just appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, this is an important aspect of, of all of our communities uh, moving forward uh, as we update, revise, make changes uh, to our comprehensive plans. And we, we're just hopeful that this tool can be useful for others um, as you go through your updates, reviewing maybe topics that you didn't really realize uh, should be included in your comprehensive plan. That's at least what we did in our last uh, update. We took this information and just ran with it and just added the information that was identified. And Kyle's done a great job of taking what was originally done and uh, adding new topics into that and making sure that uh, at least some, some of those ideas are touched on from other communities and we can all share with each other. I think he, he said it best when he said, we're all a network together. Um, you know, Greenwood County can't work without Abbeville and Lawrence, and we are also connected to Green, Greenville and Spartanburg and Anderson. So, you know, we all are in this interconnected web with each other. So what affects one of us affects others. So by doing things like this, we have the ability to, to share our ideas and thoughts. And of course, we're much better together than we are separate. So thank you again, Kyle, and, and thank you to 10 at the top and for all of you for participating in the call today. Thanks, Phil. And I guess one last thing would be that if there's anything that you think was like a like a glaring mistake or like a you know something that was wrong, um, 
maybe with figures or something like that, uh, I would just say that you can definitely contact us and we can make the changes within the presentation for you. All righty. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Have a good weekend, everyone. Too. And go Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I had to, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I was sticking around for a minute. Kyle, will you